Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. This week on the show, I have another artist who signed up through the call out for artists that I did on my mailing list. And I think I did it on the Facebook page. I don't remember. Anyway, this artist is versed in figure drawing and fantasy artwork with dragons and knights and things fighting and magic and stuff like that. A lot of it has been on book covers. We actually talk about it. It was very ironic that I met this person because I had just gotten a whole stack. I don't have them anymore because I sold them right away, but a whole stack of Conan the Barbarian books. And I was able to talk about that. Like it was just such a coincidence that the person signed up to talk to me right after I got all these really cool fantasy artwork books. So I was, I was very familiar with it during the time that we spoke, which helped out a lot because normally I don't know a lot about the fantasy uh, art sort of realm. So it was, a, it, it was a cool conversation to have. I like the fantasy art realm. I just, I'm not well versed in it. We have a great conversation about his process, how he actually moved to a new city right before the pandemic happened, which kind of sucks because you go there to meet a bunch of new artists and people and the city shuts down and you can't do anything. Luckily, he did know some people there already. He got involved in some of the online groups. So we talk a lot about that, his process, and the fact that he has recently started streaming his art process on Twitch and does like two hour scheduled paintings and color, color sort of studies and things like that. These are the discussions that we have. I love it when I get to learn about new things and sort of artistic background that I don't know very much about so I can learn more about it. So here is the episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast starting right now. My name is Neil C. I'm a fantasy illustrator, uh, formerly out of Chicago, but now living in Indiana. So uh, yeah, I do fantasy illustration for private commissions, book covers, spot illustration, any kind of packaging art, uh, uh, backgrounds. Uh, I work mostly digitally, but I love real media as well. It's just, uh, you know, digital's so fast and easy to edit when a client wants some changes. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm developing currently. And you were in Chicago. Why did you move to Indiana? <laughs> life uh, li- life happens. So yeah, I, I get uh, that. Ended up moving out. Yeah. Settled in here, got a new job literally two weeks before everything shut down. So it's been- Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Some some fortunate timing on that part. Yeah, you move so you move into a new town and then it's kind of like, but you can't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I've been here over a year now, but I feel feel like I'm still like a newcomer, you know. Yeah, I've ne- I never thought about that. That's that's tough. I, yeah. <laughs> how you so you, you have nobody like do you know people down there? Uh yeah, I uh my friend was down here and also met a handful of other people, but like broadly not like by now if I had had the opportunity to go out and meet people like probably have quite a network yeah so you don't even know like what the art community is like around there um actually that was one of the very first things i looked up okay uh, because i've been a long time figure drawing uh life drawing artist uh so i was just curious to see what was around i actually i found a little atelier school here uh lafayette atelier um and they host weekly figure drawing so i've been going pretty regularly to that Okay. What and how mm-hmm. did they adjust after the whole shutdown? Because obviously those were in public. So do they do it virtually uh, yeah, now? Yeah, they went on break for a while and then they went to streaming. Uh, they do have some people who show up in person, but it's yeah, a very small, tight knit group. It's not like a massive crowd. Yeah. And the, yeah. what is your so your background in art is? Uh, I see a lot of figure drawing and fantasy drawing. And so what mm-hmm. was what is your actual background in art. You went to school for it, if I remember you telling me? Before. Yeah, I went to uh, Columbia College, Chicago, and the, I have a BFA in the illustration program, but I coming out of school, I was nowhere near ready for anything. It took a lot of years of work after that. I think yeah. I was kind of a lazy student as well, so I, can't, <laughs> I have to own that a bit. Uh, yeah, because if you're going into art school and you're doing just the assignments, you, you are not getting ready for an art career. You're I, not using it? Say. Yeah, exactly. I went to, uh, I didn't go to Columbia. I traveled to Columbia. Mm-hmm. I actually didn't Columbia. interview. With, yeah. 
<laughs> with uh, I went to the art school down there uh, just to interview one of the teachers a, f- mm-hmm. a few years back. So when when were you going there? Uh, this was back in 2003 to 2007. Oh, so okay. I, gr- I graduated right into the financial crisis too, which is, you know, typical of my generation. <laughs> Your timing is just awful. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> like I said, life is, uh, life is a pitch sometimes. Wow. So yeah. when you left, when you left, you said you weren't prepared. Like, uh, how did you, how did you realize that? Like, what was your experience after what, what were you expecting and what was your experience basically after leaving art school? A lot of it, like I, I was just kind of going with the flow, wasn't thinking too far ahead. Um, but, you know, I was expecting figure like getting information on how to build a, like an artistic career. And that's not really what I got. Um, you know, like there's a lot of nuts and bolts that aren't relating to putting lines on paper that you have to, you know, internalize and learn. And so you can protect yourself and, you know, um, get work. Like I'm still... I had to take a lot of breaks in my like creative path just because, you know, dealing with life and whatnot. So like yeah. I'm, I'm 35 now, I still don't have the creative career career I quite want, but I'm actively working on building two of that. So right now, like my portfolio, the pieces I'm creating to add to that are kind of focused around book cover type um, compositions because that's the kind of work I'm going for. Yeah. And that was that your plan leaving art school? Is that what you were looking to do? Um, I didn't really know what I wanted when I graduated. It's, okay. it's a lot of, um, you know, like I know how to draw, which can <laughs> lend itself to a lot of different things and just like having more options than you know what to deal with. And you just kind of like paralyze yourself. It's, um, yeah, like I'm INTP and like that plays into like, you know, there's a lot of self-sabotage of that personality. I feel like, and what is not being able to make decisions. What was the thing that you said The you're what? Uh, INTP personality type. So if you look at your Myers-Briggs kind of chart, um, you know, the, there's certain personality aspects that you pick out and, um, they affect people differently. Oh. Uh, you know, you can think of it like the, uh, scientific version of an astrology chart. Just, <laughs> I guess I'm not familiar with that or, or maybe I am and I'm just not, I, I'm not. Yeah. It started with, uh, Carl Jung, uh, the psychologist. So, you know, like introvert versus extrovert, uh-huh. like that's a personality difference, uh, intuitive, uh, so me it's like introverted, intuitive thinking, um, gosh, what was the other one perceiving? Oh, Okay. Yeah. And did you self-diagnose your, uh, with this? Or? No, I, I, got, I got curious enough. I actually had someone professionally diagnose me. Really? So you diagnose like it's a bad thing. It's not. It's just like no, no, no. one extra of something or other. Interesting. Yeah. No, I've, I, I had another person on the show before who uh, essentially the outcome was that he kept kind of self-sabotaging himself and yeah, setting yeah. himself up for failure. And he finally went and got diagnosed and it like helped him immensely. Right, right. Uh, talking to or like about if it. you're ADHD and like you finally go on, uh, you know, like on some kind of <laughs> medication for that. And right. I'm sure that can be like a, a lift. I don't think I'm medically diagnosed as anything like that in particular. Mm-hmm. It's just, yeah, needing to be more disciplined, like being very clear on what my goals are, what I'm trying to do. Cause I've, I've waffled a lot. Like I tried going for like storyboard art at some point and I got, one single job in that and never again. <laughs> really? Now, now yeah. was it never again because you were like, this isn't for me or just it, you never got another opportunity? I never got another opportunity. I did get a list on a couple of agencies in Chicago and like they would go like months to like a year or something before they call me for a job and they would be like, Hey, can you come in like the latest afternoon to work with us? And I'm like, no, I have a job. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I got paid very well for that one job. Oh, well, that's <laughs> good. Like, amazing. I can build a life on this. And it was just like Sahara dry after that. Right. Had you done storyboards before? Uh, a few times. Yeah. Like in college, I, I got involved in like, there was one advertising class we had where we had to work on storyboards. And then I hooked on to like a student film project where I did storyboards for that as well. Uh, I like how that came out. It's fun. It's, it's drawing. You don't have to worry about it being too polished. It's just focused right. all on the story. Uh, it's not like comics where you need to think about like the graphic design layout of the page, it's just frame to frame, sh- shot to shot. Yeah. And you know, like if you're working with an experienced, um, DP, then they know the shots they want to use already. And they just kind of tell you what to do. What was yeah. the film that you did? 
it was a film called No One. I doubt you'll find anything about it, but yeah, it's like uh, it like I said, sounds like a college work. film. <laughs> no one, yeah, exactly. on we <laughs> semi semi quarter. <laughs> Nice. And the, uh, so with you, you said you were in college during, or you graduated around 2003. So that was probably 2007. Even, oh, 2007. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I misunderstood, sorry. but that's still pretty early on before they even taught like digital design and digital use or um, it was, well, it was at least the infancy of it. Um, yeah, you could say that like conceptart.org was like the end old deal of digital communities. Then, yeah. And yeah, um, yeah, that kind of imploded for various reasons. I'm not privy to, but I can only guess that. <laughs> I don't know if you were on there. No. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we definitely had started doing digital, but yeah, we were kind of in the early stages of that transition. Like YouTube wasn't even a thing until my sophomore year and think of like all the available tutorials and guides and artists that you can connect directly with through that medium, right. um, that just weren't really a thing. Yeah. And how did you, yeah. so did you lean towards one or the other, or do you still kind of do hand-drawn as opposed to digital just as equally or? Yeah. I mean, I always love uh, drawing and painting. Uh, I just, for the longest time, I didn't see myself doing it because I didn't think I was good enough. Like, oh, uh, that's really? not even a possibility for like where I'm at now. But like, I've been working at that pretty hard for the last like 10 years, I think, uh, which is a longer time scale than some people who are just pinpoint focused on their career goals. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I've done a lot of meandering, uh, it's just like taking me longer to get here. Yeah. What was some of the meandering? Like what are, what are some of the paths that you took along the way? <laughs> I'm curious to see like what uh, led up to what you're doing now. Yeah. So like I ran an online business for a few years, uh, selling stuff online, what? uh, got into digital marketing, uh, got, uh, like that's, that's my day job right now. Digital oh, okay. marketing. Yeah. Um, you know, had a family for a bit and, um, that's, not the case anymore. Oh, um, they're not dead. They're uh, just <laughs> got divorced. But uh, like I said, it's a, it's a lot of meandering, a lot of being pulled in many different directions. And now, since I was like in my early twenties, I feel like I have the time and the, uh, you know, like enough support that I can really focus on um, working on what I want. You know. Yeah. And you do a lot of um, fantasy work, and you've talked about like book covers and things like that. Like what? How how long have you been doing stuff in that type of realm? I grew up reading fantasy novels. I always love like the book covers and the art that accompanied it. You know, just like really kind of takes you away to a completely different world where you know it's, um, you know, like it's <laughs> as an introverted kid, you know, you end up reading a lot of books. Yeah. Uh, so that that became, you know, a way I wanted to express myself. Like I really like enjoy the sword and sorcery kind of environment. Uh, and the in the aesthetic as well, you know, all this great artists that have come before, like working with uh, Doves and Dragons, like Brom and um, uh, Michael Whalen, and uh, I, I've gotten to interact with uh, some who are a little more contemporary than that, like Michael Sass and Aaron B. Miller. He, he, he lives in Chicago. He's done a lot of like magic card art. Oh, really? Um, but these guys are all very like painterly and gestural with like their uh their illustrations so that's something i really take to like right. i'm not a fan of photo textures and uh overly rendered or like airbrushed over 3d models like that's not where i want to take my art right you like to draw it directly like even if you're working digital you're saying you like to mm -hmm. paint it inside of a painting program not use like yeah. a blender or something like that and then yeah it's still my hand making marks yeah it's mm -hmm. the only one I can, so I can only relate to this with the knowledge that I have from this weekend, because I got a whole lot of, uh, like 12 or 15, uh, Conan, the barbarian books. So <laughs> I, I know Tim Kirk, that's about, that's about yeah. the, because he did a lot of the illustration in there. So yeah, it, and there are some I, astounding illustrators who have worked on Conan. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, it's just, <laughs> they just blow my mind. And th that's the thing for the longest time growing up, I did not understand Dungeons and Dragons, but I would get the books because the artwork mm -hmm. was always fantastic. But I love the yeah. imagination of it too. And that's, that's the thing. Like when you're creating this stuff, I guess it's, I, I know that you've, uh, you, you actually have done book covers, right? Uh, I've only done one that's been published. Uh, the other, a lot of the ones in my portfolio right now are just 
like me imagining a scenario where this could be used as a cover. And that's kind of what I'm getting at is like, so I get it when you have a book and it's like, okay, this is what happened in the book. Now, when you sit down to draw something, like, how are you coming up with it? Like, do you go like, here's, I don't know, maybe I'll do a dragon or, you know, I I guess what's the process behind doing something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And that's something like I'm constantly refining that process, but um, I'm I'm a big fan of the big impactful illustration rather than like a sequential story. Right. Uh, But, you know, you're going through like there are any particular characters that like just like leap into your mind as being like very visual in a way or really critical to the story. Are there certain themes that you want to emphasize? Like, is this And then you think of visual ways to communicate that, like, oh, this character is really, like, weak and pathetic, like, versus this guy is the, uh, you know, the the seven-foot-tall, over-muscled barbarian who's just going to charge into battle without thinking. Like, how can I represent that in terms of, like, his pose, the composition, or, you know, um, like, the – how you – how you arrange those elements on a composition tells that story that you read in, like, three seconds. Right. Like, Yeah. Yeah, being able, I mean, and that's the point of the book covers too, is to get people involved. I mean, even going to, say, the comic book art, there's a thing where um, now most comic book, uh, comic books don't even, like the cover is not even representative of what's inside. It's to get you to pick up and open it. And it's, you know, there there was a whole series of like, they just had painters who weren't even comic book artists doing covers. Yeah, I I, mean, I was hearing stories of like way back in the day in DC Comics, like you could just walk into their building and like go knock on the editor's desk and like um, these guys, like I think Bill Sinkevitz was talking like, like you could just sell cover art like, hey, I did this uh, art. Do you want to buy it as a cover? And yeah. they were just like, yeah, we'll find a use for that. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the pile over there. <laughs> yeah. And then an- another panel I-, I went to at a comic con with Adam Hughes. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with any of these like I love comics as well, uh, even though like that's not my primary whole style. Shelves over there. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, Adam Hughes, he did a cover for Tomb Raider and he was waiting for them to get back to him what the story was about so he could get drawing it. And, uh, you know, like they just they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll get back to you. And they just never did. And it was getting close to the deadline. So it was just like, F it. I'm just going to draw a cheesecake <laughs> illustration. So right. he drew like Laura Croft by a pool. It's like sunset in Florida or California. And then uh, the book gets published and he takes a look at it and she's like running through the Himalayas. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't even have anything to do with it. Yeah. And they published it with the cover just like that. Yeah. There was, and there was even a lot of uh, digital brushwork that used to be on a lot of the Marvel stuff, like with the X-Men. And a lot, it was mainly for a lot of the like the new mutant series and all that kind of stuff. Um, hmm. that I saw there. Are you talking about interiors or covers? Covers. Is, the covers. Okay, is yeah. Like covers. Covers, they'll, they'll get crazy with it. Like, um, you know, like <laughs> it'll be digital mixtures of digital and physical, um, you know, like some of the real media artists I really appreciate. Like, like I brought up Bill Sinkevitz as well as like yeah. um, David Mack, who I've met a number of times. Oh. Great guy. And it's like, he does a lot of covers with watercolor and collage and, ink and um, line work pencils like he just he doesn't hide his materials at all he just kind of works it into the final piece has very like rich layered feel to it yeah you, i miss the old sandman covers how they used to actually do collage mm-hmm. and uh photographic art i was yeah thought that was really cool i was always amazed yeah, by it <laughs> dave mckean like those collage artists like i i'm really appreciative of their work even though like i don't think i could ever pull that out of myself Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I wouldn't even I I've tried a few times and I'm like that looks stupid. I'm not showing that to anyone. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So what have you been trying to do with your stuff? I I mean you've got a lot of the fantasy stuff uh, posted in your portfolio, and mm-hmm. um like what do you do with it when you're making this? What's your what's your what's your idea of what you want to do with this or why are you putting it out there? Is it just to show your work for other jobs or are you trying to uh, get into a certain market? Yeah, I'm trying to get my pieces together to, uh, and develop my skills to the point where I can start approaching art directors and and uh, publishing as well as uh, you know fantasy themed game art mm-hmm. or uh, uh, you know in the meantime I, I do a private commission here and there someone who wants their Dungeons and Dragons character um, illustrated so right. that's something that uh, I fit in there as well uh, but. I had one that was on my homepage and then I took it off just cause it's not really selling the, uh, you know, the overall 
proper composition that um or uh the the theme of this is like for book and cover art yeah because you arrange your web page that you have like a gallery yeah exactly actually this uh slaughter race one like i think i'll take that one out it's not fantasy related so i love it you're working yeah, while we're talking here <laughs> yeah yeah like uh, i'm happy with how that piece came out but it's just not quite fitting with the theme Gotcha. And another thing you do too, and this is, I thought this was cool. I know people would like to do this, but you have a Twitch channel and you actually do some live streaming of your digital art. You do, you, you schedule them ahead of time, right? Uh, yeah, that's something I started doing a month ago where it's like, okay, I, I really want something steady. So I just pick Wednesday just cause, uh, Often there are other things going on and I figure Wednesdays are open to, you know, like most people don't really have a lot of things going on. Right. So just trying to find a slot where I'm likely to pick up more of an audience that way. Um, but it creates like a fixed time slot where I'm also working on artwork and, you know, as long as you're working, you might as well turn it into content. So I Twitch stream and then I pull the highlights and create a YouTube video out of that and upload it to my YouTube channel. Uh, so that's right. just thinking about the process, like I'm very systems oriented. So, you know, like to the next thing, to the next thing, to leads to the next thing and just try to make it run. Yeah. I know some people who have done the live drawing thing, but a lot of it will be, um, they'll just have a phone on them while, you know, they're drawing on the canvas, mm -hmm. but yours is actually working digitally. You've done, I, from what I've seen, it looks like you go for about two, two and a half hours. Yeah. And, exactly. and you've been doing, uh, one of the things that you've been doing, and I'd like to know more about this is you've been showing demonstrations of, uh, digital art that you're doing, which is black and white to color photography or like, yeah. what is that series that you're doing? Uh, so that's, uh, it's really, I'm just working on a particular piece and those are the techniques that I'm trying out. So that, that piece started as a, as an online course actually. Um, so there's a particular process he was working with there. And this is a process a lot of digital artists go through where, you know, they will uh, create like a solid black, like a fully rendered black and white under layer and then tint colors on top of them, paint on top of that. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things where I'm experimenting with to see like how well it fits with me. Like I've, I've never really enjoyed that process quite as much just because the way the tints work, like I, I never feel like it's the color I want or I'm going for. And I'm used to just like mixing the colors I want, pick that up and then put it right where I want it. You know, explain to me what you mean by the, the tint process. Like I, I was looking at it and mm -hmm. there was, you know, it, first of all, the way it's set up, you have like a grid of, of drawings and then there's some, yeah. And then on the right, there's the color scale. Yeah, so I'm assuming so, this is what you mean by the tint, but explain to me more about, cause I, I watched it or I watched some of it because we were getting ready to, <laughs> to gotcha. talk. And so I couldn't see the whole thing. So I'm curious to know what that, that full process is. Plus no, nobody else listening to this watched it. So they would like to yeah, know. Of course. There you go. <laughs> so the way I'd, I'd set that up was I did my full uh, black and white render of the, uh, of the illustration and then set up different very like, plots where I can create variations of color palette. So I just pick and choose colors and paint over the top of it. And within Photoshop, uh, you can put different layers on top of things and change the opacity and the blending mode, which affects how light passes through the layer to mm -hmm. affect the layer below it. And it's a quick and easy way to uh, just drop in different colors and see how they look and feel uh, next to each other. So in that part of the video, I demonstrate um, just you know how I grab these random color palettes, apply them to my illustration, and then I'll go through each of those variations and pick out the one that I like to, you know, add to the final composition. Yeah. And the, uh, the process for that, I just found it so fascinating when I was watching it. And then at the, the next thing I wanted to know too, was like the drawing you're working on. I'm like, is that one of your drawings and you did it in black and white and now you're coloring it? Like that was the other process that I wanted to know about. Like our are you actually putting it out that way or is that your process for coloring digital art or all that kind of stuff? Yeah. I mean, the final piece that I would upload to my website, my portfolio will be fully painted, rendered in color. Mm -hmm. um, but part of the process is you going through those, um, those monochrome steps uh, just so you can, uh, you know, you can try out different things and experiment as you go and figure out, the right things uh, before you actually get to finally painting it. Cause you know, there's nothing worse than <laughs> spending tens of hours painting a, a piece just to realize the color palette's not working, you know? Right. 
Well, and, and do you prefer, I mean, with that and you're able to adjust it, I mean, I know you said like, you just like to mix your colors and you don't like that process, mm -hmm. but do you find it easier to do digital painting as opposed to like, which would you prefer to do digital painting or regular painting? Um, it's, I, I love both. I'm not like digital only for me. Right. Um, the, my ideal process is probably a little bit of both. Like I would do my color mock-ups and thumbnails and studies digitally. And then once I have those parts and pieces, take it to an actual like canvas to paint on. If I had all the time in the world and, uh, you know, like I had no expectations on that end, but uh, it's, it's one of those things where like real media, like physically picking up the paint and mixing it in. Like, yeah. I feel like I learned so much more that way. Whereas like working digitally, you learn these processes, it can be really quick, but you also, I feel like you plateau really quickly as well Yeah, because there isn't that sense of control and randomization and things you need to account for and, you know, happy accidents and discoveries. And yeah, like if you ever want to learn color better, just like buy a set of paints and mix it yourself. That's a good point. And I was just thinking as you were saying that it's like, God, it's so easy to cheat when you're or going, um, I can I, I can do something to make this better rather than like I should just know how to do it better. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, That's like in that in that last Twitch stream, like I show you, like uh, for some reason the panels and Photoshop weren't showing up on that. The way you you color pick in Photoshop, it has like the color wheel and like a little square with like a gradient, like mm -hmm. Like this is super red and then this is super dark and white and black. Um, but like a lot of digital painters, like they'll just like drag that around to like, oh, like I'll just choose a red and oh, right. I'll choose a darker red and just kind of paint like that. It's a very like mechanical process. Whereas I like to kind of base that on physical painting where, you know, like I pick out my colors and like I'll use a mixer brush uh, to digitally mix them. And the benefit of that is you, because you are starting with the same base colors, your intermediate, intermediate colors, they're all related to each other because they have the base colors mixed in. So there is a relationship there because there's a little bit of this color in that. So this color looks like it belongs there because it has that relationship with your original colors. Okay. Yeah. Does so you use sense? it. Yeah. You use it more like a palette rather than just like I'm selecting my colors and now I'm using it. Yeah, that's probably like the biggest difference in my process to a lot of other digital artists, I think. Um, I think, I mean, there there are a lot that are working professionally that are faster, better than I am. But, yeah. you know, they started with this very mechanical foundation that I'm trying to figure out a way to blend. Um, yeah, just, you know, hoping that'll create a different output that stands out in this marketplace of other freelancers. Right. And are you using an external tablet to do this or are you using a, um, a like a Cintiq, like draw on the screen type thing? Like, I, I guess, how are you painting them? Uh, so I'm using an Intuos 4. It's a okay. non-display drawing tablet that I've had for years. I've, okay. Yeah. I've lusted after those display tablets. I know. So have I. <laughs> coming around to like, maybe I don't actually need it. Uh, because uh, I, I saw this video on YouTube. Some guy was saying like, look with the t display tablet, like you're hunched over it, you're bent down. Like it, it messes with your back. Oh. Whereas the tablet, like you can sit up cause you're looking at the screen and then drawing and not looking at what you're drawing. And it kind of helps ergonomically better. And you're not creating any better artwork because it's a display versus a, a base tablet and you'll save yourself thousands of dollars. <laughs> right. I don't mind. No, I I like the fact that there, I finally have an argument for having my bamboo tablet that I've had for like 10 million years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I, I just have no, yeah, I that was my splurge back then and it was a big deal. And now it's just like, oh, should I get a new one? But then I go to use it and it's like, no, I can still use this. I don't need to spend the money. Yeah, like Wacom has such like a cult of, I don't know, not personality about it, but like, Oh, we're like we're the shiniest and the best and right. like our most expensive is what all the pros need and what you need. And like, you don't, you don't need it to create great art. No, it's, it's a company that has to come up with a new, it's just like cars, you know, they can yeah. make the same type of car every year, but no, they have to or innovate iPhones. it or iPhones. Yes. <laughs> Here's this. Okay. Slight side tangent iPhones. Uh, when those came out, one of the first things where now pe people say this type of phrase, and it's only $400. It's putting mm -hmm. only before something that's $400 doesn't make me go, 
Oh, yeah, that's not that bad. No, it's $400. Mm-hmm. Shut up. Anyway, okay, sorry. sorry. I, I got to say, like, I, I haven't been the best with money, but I saw, like, one tweet. tweet. I forgot who it is, but he was like, you know, like, you, you see that uh, – you see that TV on sale for fourteen hundred dollars, and now it's seven hundred dollars, and you buy it. You didn't save seven hundred dollars; you just spent seven hundred dollars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I'm very much a bang for your buck kind of person, and like getting finding the right tools that work for you, um, and then not spending too much money that means that you don't overextend yourself and have to like really force yourself to um, get a job to pay for this like right. debt you've taken on to get these tools that you probably didn't really need to get started. So yeah, I would say like start small and build up. My biggest discovery was realizing uh, when phone, uh, when phone cameras got so much more advanced that I was mm-hmm. like, Oh, I can use this as a scanner. Like when I do line art or something like that, and then I can just vectorize it or something like that. You know, you don't, you disagree. I don't think it's sharp enough. No? Yeah. Yeah, fine. Not quite Agree yet. to disagree. No, I'm just kidding. For me it works. Okay. You know, no, no, it's, your process. It, and and that's just me. You know, it's the when I my main thing was too is I'd be drawing in the big, you know, um the big Bristol board type thing. And then I'd have to I could never get a scanner that was big enough, so you had to do the thing where you mm-hmm. crop it in half and then attach it and all that. Yeah, kind I thought that it's a it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> enjoys doing that. I don't, let's put it this way. I don't make enough from it where, uh, that just t- scanning it with my phone isn't just perfectly fine. Let me put it, I'll put okay. it that way. Like, Got it. like for me, it's like, yeah, eh, for I mean, me, you know, I'm if all it's right. a sketch and you're going to paint over it anyway, it doesn't matter how good it looks. Right. But if it's like comic book line art where like how oh, sharp no. it is, like yeah. really matters, you know, I get that. Um, and going back to the Twitch thing, how has that been working for you? Like, uh, have you seen some progress in that? Like, I know it's not, you don't just set up and, well, you do set up and like people will watch, but building an audience is difficult there. Have you seen much progress in that? Um, mostly like the, the, the people checking in so far have been people I know. (laughs) Okay. Invite friends specifically, you know, if they're available, they'll pop in for a bit. Uh, so it's, it's not something I have a a great audience right now, but the side benefit is, um, you know, like, like I said, it is a fixed slot for me to actually work on artwork and I'm learning how to like narrate my process, which helps kind of, uh, you know, keep that aligned, you know, cause you know, if you're just rushing through it, you like, you'll skip steps or like bend rules and things like that. And kind of like paint yourself into a corner figuratively and literally, um, Mm-hmm. Uh, later on when you know you don't have the foundation that you need with that but being able to talk my way through it helps me think about it as well and being and, able to talk while you're doing it for an audience like that's that's part yeah. of the key thing instead of just not saying any, like i've seen ones where people are drawing and they're not even looking at the you know the chats like they'll have tons mm-hmm. of views but they're just drawing and people are asking questions yeah. And they don't acknowledge it not to anything of their own they're drawing and they're concentrating on their stuff yeah. like some of the the biggest of channels have like moderators that sit in and mm-hmm. kind of help manage the chat for them. So that's ideal, but not something I can justify right now. Well, and the other thing too is that it's the process of people who actually do narrate while they're talking. It's being it's it's kind of like a coordination thing, like being able to do two things at once. You're drawing, you're concentrating mm-hmm. on your drawing, but you're also explaining it. And it is a difficult thing to do. I've done a couple of live drawing ones where I'm talking and I've found that if I do pay attention to what I'm saying, sometimes the art isn't as good or mm-hmm. um the other way around. Like I, I don't speak much once I start really paying attention to what I'm drawing. It's it really and that's kind of a skill in itself. And if you're mm-hmm. going to be doing online streaming Totally, you know. It's, and some people are more disposed to it than others. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and also seeing it, it's like if you've seen a bunch of it online, it's kind of just mm-hmm. uh, it, you've witnessed it so much, it's just kind of ingrained in your head uh, yeah. that, how it's done. For me, if it's you know like auditory versus visual, like I feel like I can kind of focus on two things at once because it's activating different parts of my brain. And did you buy, now you're pretty set up with the equipment there and the mic and everything. Did you buy those specifically for starting to Twitch stream or did you already have stuff like that? Um, it's a mix of both. Yeah. You know, like there are a couple lights here that I bought specifically with the idea of streaming. Nice. Uh, just improve my setup there. Um, yeah. And yeah, this mic here, I got that as partial payment for a commission I did. Someone paid uh, you in a mic <laughs> and cash. It was like a blend. Really? Blend it. it was a friend. 
Okay. All right. I was going to say yeah. that's, that's weird. Like, how do you approach someone and go, I'll give you a I mic mean, if you do I don't mind barter. If it's something I need, and I'm going to spend money on anyway, then getting the thing itself is, you know, that still makes sense to me. I'm always worried they're going to want it back <laughs> if they barter. Uh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> now, what kind of stuff are you currently working on? Like what's, what's some of the things that you're in the process of doing artistically these days? Yeah. I mean, I always have like a huge backlog of project ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so just coming out of a project management mindset, I use a uh, Meister task, which is a Kanban board setup. So that's oh. where you have your backlog and then you have currently working on and then complete. So you take the task and kind of move it across those different columns and it's a way to stay focused. So like anytime I have like a random idea for a project, I'll throw it in the backlog. And, uh, you know, after each project, I kind of reassess my, my, what my priorities are going to be. So like, I'm going to work on this for this reason, and that should come up next or something. Um, so, you know, you're constantly reprioritizing that stack just based on what the current needs are. Like if it's a client commission, the deadline's coming up or, you know, like I really want to have this ready for a convention or this piece needs to go into the queue so I can work on it for a Twitch stream. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's kind of blending my digital marketing worlds with my, uh, <laughs> illustration right. worlds. Uh, you know, I, I love picking the best of both things, you know. Is it difficult to give priority to personal projects when you do have actual work projects that you have to do? Like, how do you how do you actually adjust the weight for that? Uh, you know, it, it's different in every single case. Like, the best way to handle it is, like I said, after every project or maybe once a week, look at that stack and make sure you're on track. So, uh, you know, if you know that you're going to get a piece done in a week and there's going to be some extra time, then you can slot in like a personal project before your next major thing. Okay. And do you actually do them as project based or do you do them in the sense where you pair it down into actual tasks inside of the project? Like, do you go, I'm going to draw the thumbnail sketch for this drawing instead mm -hmm. of like the drawing itself? Like how, 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 uh, much do you break down? Cause coming up with time is one of the things that many of the people that I've talked to has said mm -hmm. is their biggest problem. And Kanban is one right. way I do po Pomodoro method. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's, so I'm, I'm interested to see like how you do actually slot in that time, especially since you're doing uh, work for a job. Yeah. So uh, it's, I, I do break it down a little bit uh, and there are certain steps that group well together. And so doing your ideation and thumbnails and like rough compositions can be one phase and then working into your color comps, then uh, color roughs, and then, you know, settling on the final composition is, can be another phase. And then um, in digital, you'll do a lot of base layer painting, like always try to work back to front. So paint mm -hmm. the background, paint the, objects in it, paint the figures, paint the clothes, and then digital effects would be last, like, you know, a beam of light or a certain glow or something. And then, um, you know, uh, and, and then I'll do kind of final color tweaks in Photoshop. So, you know, certain thing, if it's going to print and I'll do a CMYK preview of it and it'll show me like what colors are out of gamut. So I need to adjust for those. Yeah. So that's like the final stage. And then I have the final file composition that's ready to hand off to a client or okay. post on my site. Where do you print at? Right now I have a shop set up with imprint so people can order digital prints for a few illustrations I've selected there. Okay. Uh, for the rest, um, you know, if you need to print a lot of things, like there are a couple of print shops I can hit up in town. And I also have a uh, wide format printer back there that I can do one-offs of. What? Do you yeah. really? Yeah. How much does that run you, if I may ask? <laughs> Uh, it was something like 150, but I, it was like a rebate offer with a camera I picked up. So it was, it was not expensive, but like, it's never the printer that's expensive. It's always, you know, the ink. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it, that's funny because I thought that was just a big shelf behind you, but it's just on top of a shelf <laughs> or a file yeah, cabinet yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. That's why I've set up my space. Just try to like find little corners. Wow. To tuck things into. I forgot to ask, like, what do you do your uh, digital artwork in? What are, what are you drawing in? Or is it like Photoshop, uh, a mixture of things? Like, what are you using? Uh, yeah, it's often a mixture of things. Like, I don't like sketching in Photoshop. So, like, I'll either sketch on paper or I'll sketch using Procreate. Um, you know, like, I've 
tried a few things here and there to like get away from Photoshop because it can be expensive, especially starting out. But I always find that like even if it's 5%, 10% or like 40% of the process in Photoshop, I can't seem to get away from needing Photoshop for something or other. So you might as well just accept that it's part of your process and <laughs> make use of it. Um, but yeah, the way I've been working lately, like I said, sketching on paper, sketching in Procreate on the iPad, and then kind of exporting that into Photoshop to build on top of. Do you have any uh, plans for the future or th uh, projects like you have coming up that you're kind of that you want to talk about or anything that uh, like, like what kind of stuff do you have coming up? I know that you've been, you said you had projects and you had some client work that you were doing, but like, what are, what's something where you, that you have in your backlog, something that you have in your mm -hmm. backlog that you really wish you could get to, but it's kind of been sitting there for a while, like a big project. Right. Uh, a lot of it's kind of like single pieces of artwork. I haven't quite developed a, um, a, a larger work yet, like an art book or like a story. Like I'm not so much of a writer. So like that world building right. kind of aspect is, uh, is a little beyond my capabilities right now. Actually, something does come to mind. Like I've thought about taking one of those old like novels that are in the public domain and then like re-illustrating and republishing it Yeah, because then like it's a known story. People know like this, the characters, they can see like how I choose to interpret it and it's text I can use that's not going to run me into any copyright claim issues. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that, that's something that's in the back of my head as well that I'm thinking about. Um, and then, uh, but for the most part, the others, like I said, are one offs. Like I want to do an illustration, of this particular character or this idea that I thought of that, um, you know, like I want to explore a little bit. Uh, so <laughs> like one idea I had was, uh, I was listening to like a radio program about, uh, um, uh, it's called nuclear semiotics and like their concern is like they have these like nuclear waste that has a half-life of like 10,000 years. And how do you indicate to future generations? Like this is a dangerous area. Cause if you think 10,000 years in our past, like how little mm -hmm. is left behind. Like if you make a sign, it'll get destroyed. If you uh, like bury it and like put markers and monuments on it, like they might crumble um, because this waste is still dangerous. So I thought of like some far flung future, um, with, uh, like where it's become like a religion. So you have like an atomic priesthood. And then I found out they had the similar concept already in fallout three. So like, I like it. Yeah. I'm already super intrigued. That's right. amazing. Yeah. So like, I'll think of an idea, but like, I'm not a writer to like figure out all the, like the interactions and whatnot that you can build a plot around, but right. I'll, I'll do drawings. No, that's really cool. Have you ever hooked mm. up or have you ever sought out a writer to work with, to collaborate with? Um, I haven't. Uh, it, it's definitely tricky. I'm still trying to figure out like how I might approach that. Like I am in a few like comic book um, groups where I see like a writer wants an artist to work with. And like, uh, it's it's hard for me to figure out what's fair too. Cause the writer will be like, oh yeah, like we'll split it 50, 50. And they don't realize that an artist is going to do like, three to four times the amount of work the writer is going to do mm -hmm. uh, just because the, the nature of our labor. For some reason, I just started thinking of the chasing Amy where it's the inker and the penciler argument where yeah. it's, you know, it's like, so you trace. Yeah, but... <laughs> God, I love that movie. <laughs> That's a great scene. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm a member of some of those uh, or some comic book groups too. Uh, but yeah, I just, I feel like they, there's just such a specific thought that people have in mind when they're creating this stuff that I feel like it would be hard to connect with people on. Like, I, I feel like if it's not perfect, it wouldn't match, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it would be, it's difficult to find like-minded artistically and, and writer wise possibly. I mean, or I mean, I think the, the, the biggest barrier is just how invested everyone is. Yeah. Cause I'm sure you've worked with people where like you start a project and like they fall off and you know, don't deliver. Do you have any stories in mind that you've looked at or it's just kind of a thought process right now? Um, I just kind of, I want to see like what other books in that theme were around, but I was thinking like Camarilla and Bram Stoker's Dracula is like a double feature kind of book. Oh, nice. That that would be like really cool to explore and I happen to be doing a Dracula piece right now. I was so going to say, you've got some to... vampire stuff that you've been doing. I've seen. Yeah. So. A couple things. And one of them was that uh, one of them was from a, a live drawing session. So the, the models actually dress like that. And I kind of threw that together in like 30 minutes or so. Um, just digital painting. Okay. 
So if you look at that piece, there are a lot of like kind of shortcut <laughs> renderings I did. Like his bracer is just like a cylinder and then I like I cut across it and you know, I was like for what it is, it's good enough. Like right. Uh, I might do a little more texturizing and rendering like if it was going to be a final book cover piece. And have you have you ever published a uh, book before or self-published at all? Uh, I have gotten one book published, uh, with, uh, a cover. Um, okay. I didn't do any of the work of the publishing, but like, I just delivered the cover and it got, uh, printed with the rest of it. All right. I just wanted to ask you one more thing. It's, uh, basically, is there anything coming up or anything you'd like to mention or any sort of project or whatever doesn't even have to do anything with what we talked about today that you'd like to mention or let people know about? Uh, right now, I am primarily focused on building my systems and uh, it's something that I can commit and keep keep like, perpetuating. So right now, it's focused more on building an audience. So if people want to follow me on twitch.tv slash neeltse, N-E-A-L-T-S-E, uh, that's also the same name. You can find me on YouTube. Um, so you'll catch – like on YouTube, I've, I've got an idea to like go through some deeper – uh, ideas on art creation in the process that won't be on Twitch. Um, but uh, those will be more concise videos that uh, hopefully are going to be useful to people looking to, you know, refine their own art or looking to get started creating their own art. And I'm of the mind that, you know, like the more artists, the better. <laughs> yeah. And then what, what's the website? What's your website again? Uh, just neilc.com. So keep it simple. You know, I've picked one artist name and um, that's part of my branding. So I just want to make it easy to easy to remember. Uh, I know the uh, the syllable is a little difficult because it's Chinese, but, you know, spelled out, it's just three letters, T-S-E. Um, so and that's your uh, artist name, you say? Yeah. So um, it's this is still separate from my day job. Uh, so it's part of my Chinese name. Uh, so it's C-Y. And then uh, I just took the first part and appended it to my first name. And that's a way to differentiate me because my full name is like really common. So it's hard to find me on the internet, whereas mm -hmm. I'm the only Neil C out there as far as I know. Yeah. No, you got all the domains and the handles and everything with your full exactly. name on it. Made it, it easy. Yeah. Me, mine is like basically two first names and it fits on a license plate. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it sounds like it sounds like a band member name, which you know, you are, so. <laughs> exactly. Well, I want to thank you so much for uh, talking with me today. I'm so glad I got to meet you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tom.